Well, today, on this Trinity Sunday, we look at the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28, and we'll go verse by verse, and let's see what we can glean, glean as individuals and also as a church body and the church more widely in our area and around the world. The Great Commission. Matthew 28, and verse 16, it says, And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. This is the week of the, the resurrection, probably um, probably within the week of the resurrection, and uh, Christ had appeared a number of times already. There had been some doubt, some confusion. There still was fear, but they went, as Jesus had instructed them, to go to the mountain to see him. And verse 17, it says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The Gospel of Matthew here is, is ending with a responsibility that Jesus gave to his disciples, and he did it on this mountain. He called this small group of followers, and there are some scholars would say that maybe there were others here uh, present. But what we know for sure is this group of 11 came and met him there. They were obedient, obedient to what Jesus had told them to come and meet with him. It was an appointment they made, an appointment that he made, and they both fulfilled, and they came and they met him. And it says that they, when they saw him, they worshipped him. They were filled with wonder, filled with awe, filled with reverence. And of course, the right response is just to worship. And they worshipped him there on the mountain. It wasn't a church, it wasn't a synagogue, it wasn't a temple. It was there on the mountain. But in awe, again in reverence, they worshipped him. And it says, but some doubted. Some doubted. And already there, there had been the doubting. And of course, uh, Thomas is famous or infamous for, for his doubting. Unless I see, unless I touch, I will not believe. And so there still was some of that. And, and, and I think still even some of the doubting was, was part, of the, part of the wonder. Truly has our Lord risen from the dead. Is this really him? And still they, they were there. And just as we often use that expression, I just can't believe it. I just can't believe it. We know something is true, but we say that. I can't believe it. And I wonder uh, what, was, uh, what was happening. But still they were processing. And maybe they still were in fear of the Jews. They were still in, in fear of the Romans. Uh, both were enemies of this new, of this new movement, uh, of this band of Christians. They had already killed Jesus. And they were embarrassed that he had risen from the dead, that the tomb was empty. And they were confounded and wondered what to do. And so uh, what we see here, I don't believe, was a sinful rejection of Christ, but it was just this doubt, this wonder. Is it really you? And they're trying to confirm the identity of Christ. And a little bit like on the sea, uh, in the midst of the storm, when Jesus came walking on the water. And they, they were afraid. Is it you? Who is it? Who is it? And, and the Lord said, it is, it's me. And they said, is it you really? And so there was that doubt, but at the same time, they wanted to follow through. But then the other thing we see, uh, when they saw him, verse 17, they worshipped him, but some doubted. But then, in verse 18, then Jesus came to them. And this looks so similar to what we saw in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus, when two, uh, two of the disciples were walking along, and Jesus himself came near, and he went with them. Jesus then came to them. They saw him from a distance and they fell down and they worshiped him. And then Jesus himself came to them. And he does, he does, he comes to us with answers. He comes to us in our times of doubt. And that's what he did to them, even in their doubt. He didn't, uh, he didn't call them out. He didn't criticize. He didn't shout at them, but he came to near and that's what he does there wasn't a rebuke to remind them of who he was he came near and his presence confirmed all of their questions so then we see in this uh, this short passage three resounding statements of promise of command and of assurance and if you're taking notes number one is all authority we get into verse 18 the rest of it then jesus came to them and said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me all authority 
not a little bit, not a measure. It wasn't a um, just a portion, but all authority was given to Jesus Christ, the King of heaven and the King of earth. All authority, all power, the great I am. So he begins there with that statement. Know who I am. Remember who I am. All power, all authority is given to me. Authority to forgive sins. Authority to mediate with the Father. Authority to send the Holy Spirit. Authority to open the hearts and minds of his people. Authority to reveal the Father. Authority to give eternal life. Authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons. Authority to raise us up on the last day. He had asked a couple of his disciples a long time ago on another mountain, possibly this one. Who do men say that I am? And they came up with many, many answers. They say you're this, you're that, you're a prophet. You're John the Baptist. There's so many things. But then he asked the question, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said on this, I will build my church. First Peter 3.22, we looked at uh, a few weeks ago, says all angels, all authorities and powers are subject to him, are subject to Jesus Christ. So we have all authority, number one, all authority. And Jesus said, all authority is mine. And then number two, therefore, number two, all nations. This gospel is for all the nations. Verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. No one is excluded. It is not a Middle Eastern religion. It's not the white man's religion. It's not an African religion. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, go into all nations. Go to the nations and make disciples of each one. All authority is mine. That's where he started. The power is all mine and I am sending you. It's a command. A command to them and a command which carries forward to us today. All authority is given to me and I give authority to you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Amen. It's not for a particular class. It's not for a particular culture. Not for a particular uh, uh, tribe. It is for all of the nations. And how do we go? He said, I send you. We go there in the name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given, and we saw that last week. The Holy Spirit is given for a reason. Therefore, you have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you have that power. You have that power to be my witnesses. Therefore, go. Go and disciple the nations. The Holy Spirit is there. You are weak, but I am strong, and I give you that strength, and I give you my authority to go and make the disciple, make disciples of all nations. The spiritual gifts are on us, not so that we can have fun, not so that we can be excited, but those spiritual gifts are on us so that we can serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. All authority is on him, therefore go. We go to disciple all nations. The Spirit is given us to empower us and enable us to carry out the great commission that we're seeing here in Matthew 28, to lead us and guide us in the word of God so that we can equip one another for the work of ministry and we can fulfill what he's called us to do. The gifts of the Spirit are given, as I say, not just to be blessings, not just to be enjoyed, but as Jesus said, you will receive power to become my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So we are sent by God himself and told to go. He delegates this special work. He delegates this work to his disciples. Make disciples of all nations, Jews and Gentiles, all nations, all peoples, all kindreds, tribes, and tongues. In Matthew 10, at one point he told them, go first to the lost sheep of Israel, but now 
it is to all nations and make disciples, make learners, people who know and learn and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who understand and obey the teachings of Jesus. To make disciples means to teach them, to train them so that they know Christ and obey him completely. The mission is to make fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. It's not just about converts. It's not about numbers. It is about men, women, young people and children coming to faith in Jesus Christ and are completely devoted to him. That's the mission of the church. There are many things we do and many things we can do, but number one priority is make disciples. And these other things will flow out of our discipleship. And all of our activities, the church activities, ought to be about making those disciples. Sharing the gospel, proclaiming Christ's holy life as atoning death, his justifying resurrection, along with repentance and forgiveness of sins. Making Christ followers. Go and make disciples. And it's a long-term process. It's a long-term commitment. It's not just for a period, but it is for all of our lives. The work is never done. We can never say that we're finished. We're all caught up. No. And we need to be active. We need to be intentional. We need to be planning. We need always to be in motion about that purpose of going to make those disciples. And verse 19, he continues in baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go to all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not the names. We're not serving three gods, but we're serving one God. And there is such a mystery in that, in the Trinity, that we do see the Father, we do see the Son separately, and we see the Holy Spirit. But... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God, the Holy Trinity. And so we are to baptize, baptize in the name of the Trinity, baptize in the name of God and into the name, into the family of God, into the kingdom of God, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see that baptism, it publicly identifies with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it powerfully communicates the depth of someone's commitment to the Lord when they are baptized. Remember Nicodemus, and Jesus told him, except a man be born of water and the spirit, cleansed in heart, receiving new life in Christ. And we see here that, that Christ was, was pointing towards baptism. And again on the Trinity, the Trinity is confirmed one God, but three persons. Remember the baptism of Christ. As he was baptized in the Jordan by, by John, the Father in heaven spoke and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and landed on his head. So we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all one person, all God. And again, there is the mystery. And I don't think that we'll ever fully understand it. And even in glory, I think we'll be caught up in the, in the presence of God that we won't be wondering and we won't be asking those questions. We won't be trying to, uh, trying to correct the textbooks. We'll understand the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together. So even Christ has called us, and as he, as he left this earth, he said, I will send my Holy Spirit so that you will be my witnesses, the Spirit of Christ. The Father who loves us, who sent his Son for God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And then he promised, I will send you the Holy Spirit, to strengthen you, to guide you, to be within you, and to be around you. Paul's benediction in 2 Corinthians 13, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 
So we go to all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then in verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So this teaching, it goes beyond conversion. It's not just a coming to a place of, of, of accepting, a place of, of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but then teaching. It's a change that happens. Teaching, uh, meaning the fulfilling of the main command, making those disciples. We see how Jesus discipled. We see how he taught, how he walked with the, the disciples, the apostles. He walked with them. He lived with them. They watched him. They observed him. They saw how he made decisions. They observed him in, in times of prayer. They saw his perfect, sinless, blameless life. Disciple making and that teaching, it is an investment, a big investment in the lives of others, sharing our lives with others, teaching people what Jesus did and what Jesus said, what Jesus taught and teaching that obedience, that heart change. The goal is transformation. Teaching all that Jesus had taught in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everything I commanded you, he says, everything I commanded you and taught you, modeled for you, showed you, teach those things to those that are my disciples. And as already mentioned, the Great Commission is empowered by the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, we, we see how the, how the church comes alive. We see the apostles beginning to fulfill the Great Commission. In one city, the opposition said, these men who have caused all this trouble all over the world, now they've come here. They saw the effect of the Holy Spirit in and through these disciples. Praise the Lord. Multitudes placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they also became disciples. And churches were established across the, the Roman Emperor, Empire and eventually in all nations. And today we continue that work, that call of God, the heart of God who desires that all people would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Go and make disciples of all nations, not just one area, not what just one nation, not just one people group, but every nation, every part of society. Sometimes we want to pray and maybe we don't pray it out loud, but we just feel good with those few around us. And we pray, Lord, just us four and no more. And Jesus is saying, go into all of the world. And I am sending you with all authority to do this. Be focused. The gospel is to be shared, to be given away. And it's the responsibility of every believer to be a part of that great commission to go and disciple. And Jesus wants us to finish what he began. Remember in Acts chapter 1, the first part of it is Luke is writing and also he was the writer of the book of Luke. And he said, in my first book, I told you what Jesus began to do. And then we see in Acts what Jesus continued to do through his disciples by the Holy Spirit all through that book. He's not asking us to do the impossible because he said, all power is given to me. All authority is given to me. Therefore, I'm sending you. Therefore, go. So just go in the promise and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And do it where you are. And maybe it's not about going. It's not about traveling overseas. But go where he's called you to go. To those that he's called you to meet. Your family connections and business connections and club connections and volunteer connections. Wherever you work. Be creative and wise and thoughtful, prayerful and intentional about being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. In your life and in your words. Pastors who preach, they are fulfilling the Great Commission in discipling, in teaching everything that he has commanded, everything that Christ has commanded. Parents who teach their children are fulfilling the Great Commission. Bible study leaders are fulfilling the Great Commission as they disciple, as they teach everything the Lord has commanded. There's so many ways that we can do it, but we must be active in the doing. We're doing it. 
But maybe the Lord wants us to sh wants to show us how to make disciples in a new area, in a new opportunity. And each of us as individuals and us as a as a congregation, as a as a fellowship of believers, as a local church, we need to be asking God for those new opportunities and areas where we together can go and make disciples, baptize and teach. I can't do this on my own. You can't do this on your own. But yes, we each one can do it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we get to the third, uh, third section here. And number three, always present. And I love this one. It's so reassuring. Verse 20, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. It's not a Sunday thing. It's every day. And it's not just a nine to five where God goes and, and sleeps, but he is up all day and all night. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. And Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Again, we get back to Pentecost. My spirit is within you. I am filling you with my Holy Spirit and my spirit is around you and I am with you to the end of the age. So to each one that was hearing him uh, individually that day, <clears throat> they heard him say that I am with you. And they knew for all of their lifetime, however many years that was going to be, that he by his Holy Spirit would be with them. But then he says, until the end of the age, for your generation, for all the generations to follow, for our generation today in 2020, and for all generations to follow us, surely I am with you. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we're prone to fear, but he says, I have all authority and I am always with you. I'll give you the power you need to do what I've called you to do. Hallelujah. In the very beginning there, we saw in verse 17, on the mountain there, there were some who doubted. And that's why he gave us this promise. Yes, there was again that doubt of uh, a doubt and fear of the Jews, the Romans, of persecution, thinking of what trials might come, and they had no idea really the persecution that they would face in the days to come and the afflictions. But the promise was there for them, and the promise is there for us. Always we can walk in his power and in his authority by the Holy Spirit. This is not just a future hope, but it is a present reality. When we feel at risk, when we uh, at risk, when we when we feel stretched, when we feel uncomfortable, that's the time the Holy Spirit will come and empower us to get us through and to give us good success as we're faithful to what He's called us to do and what He's commanded us to do. Jesus is always there by His Spirit, in His power. We walk in that power, that same power that raised Christ from the, de from the dead dwells in you. Hallelujah. And he says, my presence will never, ever, ever be withdrawn. In sickness, in health, in joy, in sadness, in prosperity, in famine, in close fellowship, in COVID distancing. He said, I am with you even to the end of the age. We are all, fo all followers of the all-powerful Christ, active disciples, privileged to participate in Christ's work on earth. So we need to go about it thoughtfully, prayerfully. Christ by his Spirit is guiding, teaching, comforting, encouraging, making all things work together for good. Wow. Therefore, go and disciple. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
must be 